Hey everybody, so it's that time of year again where I sit down with Kurt Kaggle and Alan Morrison to go over what we think is going to be a hot topic in 2024. Now, we've been doing this for three years, so if you want to go and check out how we did in our past predictions, I will leave those videos down below if you want to go and check those out. And this will be a longer video. I'm putting it out more as a podcast so you get the full context because I've heard from previous episodes like this, that that context is something that you're very interested in. If you would rather see a shorter version, please leave a comment down below so I can go and push that out. And yes, there is going to be LLM talk, but I did try to cover a lot of other topics while LLMs are certainly going to be influencing or have been influenced by some of these trends that we are going to be seeing in 2024. It's not the only thing we talk about. So just buckle up, have fun. I hope this is a great video for you. Put it on the background while you're, you know, maybe on the treadmill or doing some other work. I hope this is interesting to you. And if we did miss anything that you have your eye on for 2024, please leave it down below in the comments so we can go and check that out as well. All right, so with all that said, let's go get started. So let, let's go maybe with the LLM topics first. Like I think, um, like everybody's talking about like multimodal is, is, you know, uh, a big deal. Um, a lot of them are capable of doing that now. Um, at least what I've seen is, uh, you know, to get the AI less dumb, they're saying that image audio and visual is going to be the way to go because that's how humans learn things because they're observing things and they're kind of ingesting more of the mental world model of stuff. I don't know if I buy that on its own, of course, like there's more things that we need to add into the mix that, you know, we'll go into in the rest of the video. But um, yeah, I think that that's going to be one of the big pushes in 2024, getting at more of that kind of content. Yeah, I, I would um, jump into this. Um, I had a had an, an uh, article that I was looking at this morning. Uh, some guy, and I'm, I'm I'm still trying to trace back to where it was because I think I inadvertently closed things out before I actually got the link. So, um, but he was basically going on about about you know, are we past the knowledge graph stage? Mm. And and knowledge graphs are no longer important. We have these LLMs, and and you know <laughs> it's 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 really critical. And and you know knowledge graphs they they just don't contain enough information. I'm going what. It is this guy on? <laughs> um, I've been spending a lot of time in, in Lambda um, and uh, working with OpenAI and, and mm -hmm. uh, ChatGPT. And, um, you know, one of the things that I keep coming back to is there is no consistency. Uh, when you go in and you talk about now let's let's say for instance I, you know I'm I'm using as a scenario and I think this kind of gets back to the discussion you had about the multimodal and you know where it fits in terms of, of resources you know when you go in and say I have a um, a role playing game as an example and the example that I'm I'm working with right now is essentially a, a here is a, uh, a an RPG is set in a kind of quasi magic related London in in uh, nineteen oh one, and uh, you know it, it it's it's fun. You know it's a it's a chance to be able to play it, but you know its its goal ultimately is to be able to explore data models and how they're interacting and what it and what you know Chat GPT is doing, what GPT is doing. And one of the things that I've discovered is that if you say, here is a structure, and here is how I want to store my information, and chat GPT says, great, I love this structure. Thank you very much. And then you say, now build me something based upon that structure that I can use and save and persist. Um, it will turn around and give me something that looks completely different from what it told me five minutes ago. <laughs> um, and so that underlying lack of structure of consistency, it will stay consistent. Mm. Excuse me. It will it will stay consistent from session to session or less. 
but once you go from session or excuse me within a session more or less but if you if you go from session to session it's very very unpredictable and that has a lot of implications because when you're starting to say look i want to move beyond what chat gpt is going to give me for structure or i'm wanting to basically say anytime i have uh, an entity of type character or of type building or whatever mm -hmm. This is how I want to be able to display it. You're very much dependent upon that structure being consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, and, that's and, the name of the game yeah. with everybody, all the big, big, big ones out there. Uh, that's what they're doing with their graph is, is shooting for consistency, completeness and consistency. But when they say completeness, they're really just talking about like, do we know what Google knows? Because that's what kind of everyone knows. <laughs> Yeah, and oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Alan, you were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to. I was just going to say it. It's the multi multimodal aspect of it is is really compelling and at the same time frustrating because mm -hmm. for so many decades we we haven't had the compute networking and storage to really put everything yeah. out on the table together. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we're about with the the knowledge graph space is getting all this in one place. In one, so you can build contexts, and so image and, and text together obviously mm -hmm. uh, would be wonderful to have mm -hmm. in terms of building context. And and um, I guess my point of main frustration with LLMs this year is that um, you know there's not that sense of how to build the context and keep it going yeah and and so it's, it's sort of like we're in this little niche uh i i think in terms of the foxes and the hedgehogs and and we're a group of foxes here so we like to use different tools for different things and figure out different ways of doing things whereas the hedgehogs they're used to doing things one way yeah so you might have 90% hedgehogs and 10% foxes in the mix here mm -hmm. in the LLM space. Mm -hmm. And you get all this noise coming out of social media as a result. And oh, so, yeah. uh, so, so the strategy, the strategic thinking that really that leadership needs to have gets buried in the noise. Yeah. Is that your impression too? You know, I, I think there's a few things to unpack there because one, um, there's a, I have a video, I'll put it up top or down below or something. Information literacy is so missing in so much of all of this. And you might be thinking, how does that connect with <laughs> what Alan just said? Um, you just said the executives, the folks that are looking at it, the social media is giving them noise and impressions. If they understood also that that is curated view to them and their personalization. So if you start feeding in or going down a rabbit hole and you are a hedgehog and you're like, oh yeah, this, this one thing that I'm really, really want to dig into and I want to see what others have to say about it, you start to engage more and more with the things that sort of agree with you. And then you get more and more of that. So just be cautious about all that. I think that's an overall theme to things in 2024 is, Get some better literacy for for everyone, and maybe we'll touch on some other you know things that need to come about because of that. But yeah, I would I would agree that you know, and, and maybe this is me showing showing that is happening to me that that um, personalization rabbit hole of graph gives context as as a solution to context. It doesn't mean a graph. I know a lot of folks out there that have built a great knowledge graph. It's this big, beautiful thing. And then you look under the covers a little and it's Wikipedia. That's all it is. It's maybe Wikipedia and like a few other things thrown in. You would not like, I mean, I'm telling you guys, like the amount of knowledge graphs that I've seen from like the things that are out there that everyone like, you know, see the brand name and you would know them that just use Wikipedia basically is kind of scary, <laughs> which is maybe also showing why all the LLMs are the same level of dumb to a certain extent. Um, and there's other themes too, like how they can supplement that, that I want to go over too. But yeah, I think that um, knowledge graph for such a long time has just 
been, I, I once had someone, some uh, very high level executive engineer describe it to me like, okay, Ashley, we got all this content. We have all this, this data and yeah, we're trying to fix it. And you're talking about this knowledge graph thing. That's like trying to build a balcony on a shack on the beach. You don't need to worry about that just yet. And now I guarantee he is scrambling to figure out how to do a consistent ontology, trying to put shackle shapes on it to validate that darn thing and doesn't know what to do with it because it was a balcony that he didn't really need. Um, so he's not, he, he wasn't really thinking through some of the other applications of it. It was just like this, oh, well, I'm not familiar with it. It kind of just seems like something that I could do um, with the traditional things that I know about. So I think that that's constantly, and then that's not just with knowledge graph, that's with anyone not as familiar with machine learning or anyone not familiar with using a stick over an automatic, like, you know, this is humanity, right? We like to do the things that we're familiar with, but Alan, to your point, I think that um, LLMs in general are pushing that boundary though. People have to start to learn some of these things, um, but being aware of what they're being exposed to and whether they're just feeding into their own bias, I think is, is an important part. Well, I, I think there's, there's a couple of factors that play in that as well. One of them is uh, there is a very big reluctance among the people in the deep learning community to want to admit that there are things that deep learning really isn't very good at. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and knowledge graphs are one of those sore spots because it basically sounds like, well, okay, we should be able to store all of this information into an LLM. Well, you can if you have the resources of a Google or a Microsoft mm -hmm. to be able to do so. You know, if if you've got, if if you basically have your own, you know, large scale uh, island of racks mm -hmm. of of um, of compute power and several billion dollars to throw at it, mm -hmm. yeah, great. LLMs are wonderful solutions. But realistically, no LLM is going to contain all of the information that you're dealing with. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, there was actually an interesting piece lately I saw about our rags going away. Is, is rag going? Rag mm -hmm. is, is uh, uh, retrieval augmented generation. And mm -hmm. rag is important because it's part of lang chains, which mm -hmm. are the mechanisms that are used once you retrieve content or as you're retrieving content from, from these language models to essentially augment that with additional information that comes from other sources. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this intrinsic bias I'm seeing now in, in, the, in the deep learning community to say, yeah, we want rags to go away. And I'm going, why? You know, what is the rationale for this? Well, we're going to increase our attention you know, make sure the attention, which is the thing that controls the context, we're going to make that bigger and more efficient. Well, you know, that's great. I would love that. You can do a lot more if you have a big, big, big augmented, uh, big augmented uh, context. But if you then go in and say, yes, but what about all of that information that is contained in knowledge graphs, in relational databases, in whatever, your PDFs, you know, things that aren't currently being stored and probably will never be stored in LLMs. What about those things? Yeah. And that's an area that I think tends to get glossed over. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, you get a lot of, of people in that community that say, well, we've got knowledge graphs. And I'm going, where? You know, wh what structure do you have in this yeah. vast plethora of, of zoo animals that you're talking about <laughs> here that actually is a knowledge graph rather than simply being yet another flavor of very, very, very great or very big, um, uh, very compact, you know, uh, um, what's, what's the term I'm wanting? Um, you know, zip files is what it amounts yeah. to. Yeah. You know, that, that, when you, you get right down to it, that's what an LLM is. It's it's a it's a great big honking zip file that is smeared information across across literally, you know, terabytes of information. 
And you're going, well, that's really great, but it's a it's a read-only zip file. It's pretty mm. useless for doing database stuff. <laughs> you want to be able to actually store information and work with it. Yeah. Then, then LLMs are pretty much useless. So, so you know, it's it, it's one of those that I think that from the standpoint of of you know the knowledge graph community that is used to thinking about the fact that they are read write operations. Mm -hmm. You know, you do have to curate. You do have to basically you know, add into the fact that the world does change and it changes on more than simply a quarterly or even semi-yearly yeah. basis. Um, and that's not going to happen so long as that attitude is so persistent yeah. in the deep learning community. So in, think... in some respects, I think one of the things that I'm hoping to see this year is, is you know, saner minds, or at least not so focused <laughs> minds, can actually start saying, now, wait, we have to get the rest of the world working with you guys, because this isn't the, you know, the, what you have here is not the, the be all and end all of information. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Alan. Well, it goes, goes back to tribalism, doesn't it? Mm. And it seems like mm. rather than staying with the tribes that we have, we have even more tribes now. <laughs> Um, and so the, the, the tribalists are specialists at creating new silos. Mm. And so we have... Oh, it's protectionism you know, a little bit too with that, right? Like, well, if I make this great silo and I'm the expert, who else can come in, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and um, you know, I, I, I just think it goes back to leadership and it, it goes yeah. back to, you know, what we've seen in 2023 is really uh, a very high level of passivity when it comes to artificial intelligence generally. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it, it's a deference to the people who do, who know how to do machine learning mm. because it, it seems intimidating to, to a lot of us. Mm. And um, so we're going to defer to the people who know how to do machine learning and we're not going to, you know, when we try to regulate, we're going to defer to them on how we regulate, which is exactly the wrong thing. I think you need more diverse intellects in the mix mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. do proper a AI regulation. Yeah, yeah no, I, I really, really agree with that. And, you know, there, there's a point, too, um, that, that Kurt had mentioned that I think you're also alluding to, Alan, um, that a lot uh, on the leadership side, yeah. I would point back to information literacy, um, but also the cost, right? Um, you know, if we say, oh, RAG's going away, everything's going to be in the LLM. Okay, did you look at how much it's going to cost to get everything in there and all the legacy <laughs> systems and all that? Let's, let's go back to our data migration strategies here, folks, and see how much that's going to cost. And also, yeah. you know, if you're if you're creating a simple index, Right. You just create an elastic index, maybe. And um, that's all you need. Do you want to look at the price of that versus sticking everything into an LLM? You know, I, I had a video um, not that long ago about does AI negate the need for a taxonomy? And I think that video actually did so well because a big chunk of it is talking about the cost. Right. Like we want to say so much. Oh, LLMs are going to replace this, this, this and this. It's supplementing. It's changing the way things are done for sure replacing comes with a cost. As we all know, when you want to replace anything, it comes with a cost because of migration and all the other stuff you got to stick into it and running it, right? Like I think Kurt, you had mentioned like, yeah, if you're one of the, the big ones, you're, you're going to be able to afford to do all of that. And also, do you know where all of your data is to put into the LLM? Probably not. You're probably duplicating it everywhere. So there's a huge cost perspective to this that I think is maybe the first way of getting the leadership to pay attention a little more. Because one thing I've noticed working with a lot of people on the ML side is unless they are a, a manager or someone that is, again, higher up on the machine learning side, which, again, look at any given organization, how many of those even exist, um, those folks exist, um, most people doing ML know there's compute costs. And they look at somebody and say, what's my budget for this? That's really like the extent of it. 
Um, but I think um, to, you know, what you're saying here, Alan, is you, you can't give the regulation, even decision power, just to one group because you have to look at the composition of the the, the group, right, um, in across the board. And I don't know, maybe I've just been working in the wrong places, but machine learning groups are often very small and they are very specialized. And oftentimes they are not, part of their composition is not a leader that also understands um, the, the greater scope of the technology space um, for their organization. And a big part of that is cost. And I think that that's um, one of the things that we need to help educate folks on. And maybe that's where going back to like getting people that maybe don't use knowledge graphs more in, you know, looking at the knowledge graph for some of these uh, LLM applications. Maybe that's one reason they're not looking at it because in the past, spinning up a knowledge graph was incredibly expensive. But now, funny enough, because of LLMs and, you know, storage costs going down and there's now a lot of knowledge graph for hire, like knowledge graph is a product that you can just get and, and build off of it's becoming less expensive to build a knowledge graph. So if you don't already have one, that cost prohibitive piece is maybe going, uh, not not away, it's, it's going down maybe. A, a friend of mine introduced me to uh, Wardley diagrams, W-A-R-D-L-E-Y. Um, you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's good. Uh, the, the nice thing about Wardley diagrams is they're a very, very good way of being able to look at maturity of a technology mm -hmm. uh, based upon its stack of, of related technologies. And I, a friend of mine introduced me to them, you know, about a couple months ago when I've been happily plotting away myself with uh, uh, worldly diagrams and DSLs, which is always exciting. <laughs> um, but the thing that I find, and to, exactly to your point, um, you know, we're reaching a stage right now where, up until comparatively recently, um, you know, the uh, the technology has been at a stage where it was still largely bespoke. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you had, uh, you know, the cost of being able to put together a knowledge graph was significant in part because there were, you, you did have this, this fundamental issue of how do you build infrastructure into it to be able to populate it? How do you basically get the information in a way that has a decent set of ontologies working with it? Mm -hmm. And how do you take that information then and use it as part of a, a, a broader pipeline? Um, we're seeing that now shift. You know, if if you if you look at, you know, there's there's the x-axis of, of worldly diagrams is basically a measure of its maturity from basically very, very immature all the way up to uh, highly commoditized and, you know, just the cost of doing business. And over the last couple of years, I know I've watched as we've moved from about a 0 0.3 to a 0 0.4 or maybe in a little bit beyond that, to the point where, it, uh, to your point, and I think it's 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 an important one, this technology is no longer, it, it's reaching a stage where it's not quite yet a commodity, but it's getting there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think the, um, the one thing I actually am kind of in heart to see, and we're talking about how all this technology fits together, is that you're beginning to see the emergence, and I'm seeing, you know, a few companies here and here beginning to do bits and pieces of this, of saying, well, we're reaching a stage where we can talk about data in something that has both a knowledge graph and a vector store and some mechanism to be able to write to an LLM mm -hmm. for long-term storage so that you have essentially this arc of information that goes from from very fast, very transient transactional data mm -hmm. through through structural data, which is largely the province of the knowledge graph, mm -hmm. and from there into the larger larger picture of an LLM as part of a store for an organization. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, I, I, I'm firmly convinced and I, you know, I, I may be in the minority here, but I'm firmly convinced that our notion of knowledge graphs as independent entities or knowledge, let's call it uh, knowledge platforms, knowledge engines, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like onto text or, or start off or whatever. I think their days are definitely numbered. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a point where knowledge graph engines are going to increasingly be part of a broader piece. And you're seeing it some with mm -hmm. Stardog and you're seeing it some with uh, um, uh, DGraph and a few others like that, um, where you're saying, hey, we can get to the point where we have vector comparisons. Mm -hmm. We can get to the point where we have the ability to pull in descriptions so that all the annotations that we're working with don't have to come from scratch, that we can pull in something that at least uh, uh, gets us started for those annotations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, and and I, I want to give Alan a, a minute here to, to respond to on this topic, but um, while I don't think they're going to go away, I I do. I mean, there's always like the the use cases where you don't need to use it with the grander scheme of things. You just need a knowledge graph. Um, I do know that for the past like two years, this is even before LLMs really hit as big as they are. There has been a if you're really paying attention to the graph space, especially the vendor space, there is some weird stuff going on. There is weird stuff. There is some either buyouts or closings or some other things are going to be happening. I would say in 2024, we're going to start to really see more of it um, because the tech industry by itself has kind of been like struggling strangely, even though we have the LLMs to, to contend with um, where we got to feed it to people and not just content and data, right? We need people to work on them. Um, annotations and machine learning and like all the things in between. Um, but yeah, there is, I, I just know like all the, the, the vendors that I know, there's a lot of cool startups showing up. Um, I just, yeah, there's some, there's some interesting things that I think are going to happen in the vendor space for knowledge graphs this year. Yep. At the same time, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there's a lot of less favorable developments uh, mm -hmm. in the vendor space. And, mm -hmm. and one of them, so I, one of the, trends that I saw in 2023 was that you've got this workbench scenario where you, you have these database vendors who are building LLM workbenches, mm -hmm. for example. And so they'll be adding vector fields to their databases and, and uh, trying to address the, the RAG scenario in mm -hmm. some small way. And I think RAG can be broad or it can be narrow. And if mm -hmm. it's just narrow and if you're just minimizing the, the role of RAG and how it's done, mm. then you really are throwing the baby out with the bathwater, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And it, it goes back to, you know, what is data management and uh, what's the knowledge component of data management? And the knowledge component really is logic management as much as mm. it is data management. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just untrapping that logic, putting that logic in with the, the uh, instance data in the graph and basically giving that logic power mm -hmm. in that process through accessibility and findability and reuse. Yeah. Uh, all of those things are possible now, but so few people are really aware outside of pharma and perhaps yeah. financial services of the power of them. Yeah. I think a part of it too, because we're getting into some like, fair data kind of stuff here too that you're talking about um not only is like the governance and you know we we i know kurt early on was talking about consistency um the other big rise is um i'm I, my my big prediction i think i've said this in a different video already um as a, a hot take at the end so maybe nobody saw it but i am telling you there is going to be a service or a company that is going to do annotation service as for hire, right? So you oh, already, already have, is. 
Well, not to the extent that I think it's going to happen though, right? Like I know that there's all there's, I mean, there already has been for a really long time, right? Like if you're just trying to tag up ML, you know, training sets and that sort of thing. But I think it's going to be a lot of the folks that were doing, you know, taxonomy and, and, you know, um, kind of classification manually that those, those skill sets that, a lot of LL, I mean, it was even before LLM um, that were kind of getting folded into the annotation space instead of just, you know, doing indexing as as they were doing traditionally. I think that's going to become maybe a new a newer gig culture. It's already happened, I know, but it's going to become an even bigger thing because yep. all this fair data is all well and good and, until you figure out that wait, you based a lot of your graph on Wikidata and that's not all accurate. And, oh, someone uh, got divorced yesterday. So now your your answer that you're giving in your LLM is not accurate. Oh, and what do you do? And this is, this is where I'm going with it. What do you do about controversial topics? That like, if you're doing annotations and you have a group of humans and you're talking about, you know, name your controversial topic, there's going to be differences of opinions. And so I think people are getting kind of sick of um, the neutral answer that you get from LLMs on many of these because it can't decide or maybe it regurgitates one side over the other if it has more in the training set. But I think that's where the annotation as a service is really going to start to get even more robust is specialists, people that can do research and maybe craft a more um, evidence-based response that is not for or against, but it kind of just shows you the evidence of it. I think that kind of nuance is going to show up a lot in 2024. Yeah, I would I would tend to be. I think the um, I've actually been approached by you know a couple of companies that, that are moving into that annotation space, mm -hmm. and and again, you know, I think I, I, you're exactly right. You know, it's there. There's there's actually a couple of different aspects of that. One of which is that many of those companies are are basically recognizing that there is a very, very strong, extraordinarily strong English bias mm -hmm. in most of the, the information that you have. Yeah. And when you start looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, say I want to be looking at um uh Farsi or I want to be looking at uh you know variants of Chinese or whatever that have very different focuses and different um uh often very controversial uh points of view um you know these aren't getting cop captured you know? mm -hmm. and and I think that that's uh you're seeing this movement towards saying whatever our data is you know we need to be able to deal with that data in a way that represents our particular needs, whether that's a government or a, a an organization or a corporation, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, that process doesn't change. And I think if anything, you know, the, let's face it, metadata is expensive to produce. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it is by its very nature, something that you need to have some kind of understanding of the topic domain that you're dealing with for a corporation, for a business, that metadata can actually be, can actually be very problematic because, you know, the, the, you can go and talk to one of these big LLMs in this overall space, but they're not going to, they're very, gen, very generalized. Mm -hmm. And the information that, the information that I see becoming emergent is going to be the process of, of specialization. You know, yep. I, I think, you know, as, as I've been looking at it, you know, I expect, you know, Bloomberg moved very early into the space. And I think that was exactly the right space. To do mm -hmm. it. They, were, they were practically, you know, right there about the time the GPT-3 first came out yep. saying, you know, we're developing our own tech and we're going to be building yep. on, on that space as well. You're seeing that with other industry sectors that are now saying, wait, you know, we don't want Microsoft to be setting our metadata 
especially, you know, if, if you're talking about financial services, if you're talking about real estate, mm-hmm. if you're talking about, you know, supply chain management, each of these have very specific requirements and needs. Yeah. Yeah. And each of these, you know, even to at, at even at the industry level, um, those are not going to be things that these organizations are readily going to give up to a single, you know, one ring to rule them out. And we've, as ontologists, we've learned that that's not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we recognize that that ontologies, by their very nature, tend to be parochial. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that realization is now coming to organizations that are saying, well, yeah, but our data, the things that we're working with here is data that is specific to our domain, is should be controllable to our domain. How do I make sure that, that you know, whatever my system is, um, you know, when someone is looking at it uh, from an AI perspective, they have the rights to be able to use it. They can mm-hmm. actually see what they're supposed to see. You know, it's all great and good to talk about um, multimodal systems and, and the like, but multimodal systems don't mean squat when when you're in a system, in a situation where your competitor can basically pull up information from your LLM yep. to be able to find out everything that it needs to know because there is no such thing as security in that space. It's basically what guardrails were put up by the organization yeah. to protect but the big organizations, you know, the, the the Microsofts or whatever, to protect themselves against liability, not to ensure the the protection of that space. And I think well, that, I, I think that I mean there's the liability piece, yes, but I do I mean there's like graph for hire, right? A good example is uh data uh, no, not data.world. That that's not a graph for hire. Um diffbot, right? Like they've been creating knowledge graph that you can, you know, have a, as a SAS and do whatever you want with it. And there's models that they use so that your data, your proprietary data can be integrated with their graph without actually being integrated into the, the, the mother graph, you know, on the other end, like these models exist. Like, I don't think it's now whether you, and you know, when, I, when I say trust, I'm not talking about the, the, you know, diff bots of the world. I'm talking about that, you know, Gen AI, uh, big, big ones out there, uh, like chat GPT, do you trust them to actually keep that boundary? I think is, 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 a, is more in line of what I would agree with on, on Kurt's point. Yeah. And I think the more proactive industries, uh, to your point, Ashley, um, are, are being even more careful about the mm-hmm. security aspect. I, I interviewed, uh, Dave DeGaulle late last year. And Dave is somebody I've known for years. Um, He's the founder of Enterprise Web, which is a proprietary graph approach that um, has a lot of good functionality. It has um, software agents to to manage changes to configuration. So uh, they've been big in the telecom space because Mm -hmm. there are so many configuration aspects to, to switching, for example. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you're trying to virtualize your whole switch space mm-hmm. and they call it network function virtualization, then using agents and a graph model is is very helpful. Mm-hmm. And, and so I thought Enterprise Web did a very intelligent, took a very intelligent approach in the telecom industry to how do we use generative AI? And basically what they said was our default is going to be that um, we'll use this as a language model for an interface, mm-hmm. but the rest of it is not, it's gonna be off limits to the gen, gen AI. So it basically it's just the UX, the user experience, mm-hmm. the, the question and answer aspect of it, that's the default. Now they can work with customers on a custom basis to, to do other things with the generative AI, but but I, I thought that was bright because basically telecom companies want to manage their own information. Yeah. And, and so it's an example of, a, of an industry that seems to be more proactive along those lines. Yeah. I mean, I and would say medical. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. 
No, 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 go, go on, please. No, I was just saying medical, legal, um, anything with finance, like, the, you know, the, the folks that I think there's re regulations, but also just like, hey, you know, if one side of your business is handshaking with the other side of the business, it's 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 no bueno. <laughs> and, and, you know, especially like on the fin fin finance side, you know, you got to make sure that nobody's looking at somebody else's homework, so to say. And so they're used to this kind of thing where it's like, no, 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 no. These these things cannot go together. Another good example um, is like aerospace. I used to work a lot with aerospace companies. And so a good example of like cybersecurity, they do not let any system that touches the cockpit touch anything that the passengers ever have access to, right? It's, it's a physical boundary so that nothing can mess with those things. And so, you know, not saying that we can have physical boundaries across all of all of the the data silos. Sometimes you can. Um, and actually, that's a, that's another weird trend that I, I think is going to start to to show up as as a side note is people getting off the cloud. I have heard some very big companies who went up into the cloud. They they got things cleaned up. They they used all the compute power that they needed to use to do the things that they needed to do. And then they realized, hey, I don't think we need all this anymore. And they went back to on-prem and they're actually saving a buttload of money uh, all the time now. And that doesn't even preclude them from going back up into the cloud if they needed to, because they still have the blueprints to, to do so. Um, but I think that's that's going to be um, another trend that we're going to see is, is people kind of getting off the cloud. And if you did do that, then you do have those physical boundaries <laughs> so that you don't share things with others. Understanding that's not... You know, it, it, we're saying it's a trend for a reason. It's not common yet. Um, but I mean, look at the government stuff. Like, I remember early, early days of cloud, and I was working um, on the government side and uh, government contractor, at least. There was no way. Like, you had two different computers, right? You had the one that could connect to things, and then you had the one that did not connect to anything, right? And those days are still around in, you know, certain pockets. Um, but I think maybe going back to that a little bit. I don't know. We'll see. And maybe that's a, a soft prediction of not next year, but a few years past after that. No, I, I'd, I'd actually say it's it's a trend to watch in 2020. Yeah. You know, I'm I mean I'm hearing that from my own clients. Mm. Um you know the same thing. It's it's not necessarily wholesale abandonment of the cloud. Yeah. Yep. It's increasingly looking at the cloud as something that exists primarily as a mechanism for handling certain types of interactions and certain types of data. And, you know, to the extent that, uh, and, and I mean, we're still, there, there's still a lot of best practices that we're constantly reviving. But I think one yeah. of those is, is essentially saying, okay, how do we develop hybrid strategies? You know, mm -hmm. what's, where, where is the best place? What, you know, what level of control do we have for this? And, and you know, what you're seeing is that, that cloud, you know, our, our definition of cloud is becoming much more subtle, you know, because even when you're talking about on-prem, you're still basically talking about, okay, you know, it, it, it's where are, where, where are my, my servers currently located? And it doesn't necessarily mean, hey, I'm moving them back to my office in Poughkeepsie. <laughs> uh, or Seattle, even in, this, in my case, but uh, uh, much more to rather saying, no, we're going to basically say we have something for our large scale interactions with public in interactions that we can trust our boundaries to, you know, because the data involved is not going to be data that we're that concerned about getting out. Mm. But, you know, that we're moving towards more secure, um, you know, semi-clouds, you know, call them low-hanging stratosphere mm -hmm, era, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, cumulus clouds as opposed to the big stratosphere. I can the, already the see a, a, a blog post from Kurt now with this visual of like the different the stratospheres. <laughs> yes, I, I, it's it's already on my list. You know, I, I, I said it and said, I'm going to start talking about weather patterns in, in, in our, our cloud <laughs> technology. But but it's there, you know. We're we're getting to the stage where it's not so much that we're moving everything back to my office. Mm -hmm. It's we're moving everything to 
more control, more controlled, more secure yeah. premises that are not, you know, not Amazon or Azure or yeah. you know, fill in the blank, Google, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and you know, switching gears just even slightly off that, but I think my brain goes to this be from that conversation because I used to work a lot in um, the content and publishing space. And I know both of you have kind of dabbled in, in this space as well. Um, you know, the interesting thing that we're kind of talking about that touches on, on the publishing space is, you know, there's this big announcement that the Times made everything open, right? And then immediately I saw other things talking about how um, they're that's going to improve a lot of the open source LLMs that are out there. And I thought, hmm, this trend to open data, right, is is everyone keeps talking about, well, you know, there was um, a new, I think, drug that was, or interaction or something that was discovered because a lot of medical data is already open and more and more of it is becoming open. And that's a good thing, right? That we can have more discoveries, it can be faster, you know, we can iterate on things as humans. And But I then saw the copyright stuff start to show up, which is, okay, it's open, but is it actually able to be used in some of the LLMs? And the answer is mostly no, it's not. Like there's, there's a lot of things that you still need to look at, even if it's open, that doesn't mean you can just use it for anything. Um, some of it you can, but you have to check in it. And so I'm wondering if there's this interesting dichotomy going on where publishing for a very long time has had this debate over open or paywall. And a lot of folks were moving to open, but now with the LLM space, I almost wonder if they're gonna to start to pull back a little bit on that because their content is gold. If you wanna talk about specialized niche information that is highly trustworthy because it's been cited I get it. There's a lot of publishing issues too in citations and fake data. Don't, that's a whole nother video if we want to do that. But, you know, for the most part, it, it's it's supposed to be evidence-based. It's peer reviewed. You know, it's it's mostly largely okay to, to think it's trustworthy if you check it out. Um, that's really rich data that most LLMs have no access to. And so this piece of publishers going open source or not coupled with this other piece that I started to show up in, in end of 2023, which is with all the copyright stuff getting pulled back, right? Like the, the stuff going on with ChatGPT right now in the times um, is, can you, can you use that data in LLMs? And if the answer comes back as no, which I would suspect is what's going to happen or some amalgamation of no ish, um, that means a lot of the open source LLMs that a lot of folks have been saying are doing even better because they are open and because others can iterate off of it, it means they're going to be at a disadvantage because they won't be able to pay for the paywall content that the other big ones can. So I think that these two um, weather patterns, to take the, the analogy uh, of, of Kurt, um, there's going to be a storm of ruin. And I am very intrigued to see how that's going to start to shape up in 2024, because those two things I guarantee are going to be coming together soon. Yeah. Um, I, 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 let me see Dallin, because I've, I've talked too much, but I've, I've got some points I want to make on that too. Well, why don't you, why don't you start Kurt and then I can, I can follow you. Yeah. yeah. Um, Alan is so polite. <laughs> He is. He is is wonderfully polite. I love. I love working with him. Everyone loves Alan. That's why he's on this with us. <laughs> I know. I know. We, we love you, Alan. We really do. Uh, <laughs> Art, <sorry>. Alan. <laughs> uh, I actually just love to see him blush. It's it's, it's a funny thing, um, but <laughs> my, my, I I I'm watching the the New York Times decisions and how mm. this plays very very carefully because what we've done is uh, or what we're doing in now and it's not a matter we, we've done it yet i don't think we were even begun to get there is basically talking about what does copyright actually mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and you know up until a fairly recent time copyright has usually had a fairly 
fairly well-defined meaning. You know, you you have you have this understanding from the standpoint of a publisher of, of a producer that when you produce something, you own the copyright to that, and you're selling the rights to another organization to reprint those. What what you've basically done, you know, sometimes with with um, you know embargoes or sometimes with the ability to say, okay, you know, I have first North American rights or whatever. You know, as a writer, that, that becomes a significant issue. LLMs have basically forced us to say, you know, when we're talking about making information available on the web, what does copyright actually mean? And and is it actually adequate protection for the kind of wholesale swiping mm -hmm. of huge tracts of the internet where these agreements that have been between publisher and creator um, are just kind of thrown out the window? Mm. Um, and I think that I think that that's part of that reaction. I, and I absolutely agree with you in saying that you know one of the consequences of that is that. Now creators and publishers are beginning to strike back and say, no, you can't have access to what we're doing. I, I kind of keep expecting places like Wikipedia to say, you know, we didn't exist so that we can basically be your data source. Mm -hmm. you know, talking to Microsoft or, or you know, one of the other big ones. Um, you know, that's not, that was not our intent. And, you know, this represents the work of literally, you know, tens of th millions of hours of contributors. Where, where they're going to go the route of Twitter slash X, where they used to be a huge resource of data for uh, doing machine learning. Then they shut that down and now they're making their own LLM off of it. So maybe that's the route they'll take instead. Who knows? I, you know, I, I fully expect you, you're right. You know, everyone is basically looking now at, at, you know, how do we monetize? And that means how do we capitalize on our resources? And what does that mean for the uh, individuals, right? Like Wikidata doesn't exist on its own, right? Like no, it doesn't. people are writing these articles, people are writing their tweets, people are, are making their content, even if it is on a larger platform. And what is their rights associated with it, I think? Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I, I'm going to go broader because that's my my tendency, if you haven't realized it before, now you do, <laughs> um, and, and say, you know, data quality is going to be a huge issue going mm. forward, mm -hmm. an even bigger issue. And it, it goes back to the garbage in, garbage out yep. scenario. Yep. And the, the fact that you've got folks who, uh, to your point about literacy, Ashley, um, maybe aren't quite so information literate as they need to be. Mm -hmm. So they might be generating lots of uh, synthetic data. And yeah. it's gonna, it's ending up in the LLMs. You're seeing a lot of the garbage sort of mm -hmm. randomly appear uh, in, the, in the output of these LLMs. And so, you know, I think that those who are most careful about data quality to begin with, are gonna be the only guardians of, of the input. And mm -hmm. so how do we empower them? That is a huge question. How do we empower, I mean, not only the Times and, and Wikipedia, but anybody who's got quality data. I've been uh, working with um, Charlie, Charlie Hoffman a lot, who is one of the pioneers right. of XBRL. Uh, and, and Kurt has had a whole history of his involvement in, in the in XML business reporting language, uh, extensible business reporting language or whatever it's called. And, and so there's a follow on to that. It's a standard called uh, the, the standard business report model, SBRM. So the idea is semantic spreadsheets. Since you're creating spreadsheets anyway, for financial purposes, let's say in financial reporting, why not link up your spreadsheets and make those build a context for your spreadsheet, share it out that way, so that you've got basically graphs at the document object level. So it wouldn't only be spreadsheets, but also um, text documents, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And so I like that, that 
um, what Charlie is doing with, with Pete Rivet on that and some others. There's a whole group of people at the OMG mm -hmm. working on this um, because it's at a different level of abstraction. You're in, sometimes when you're in RDF land, you're, you're basically in assembly language mm -hmm. at, at that level. You know, if you're at the document object level, it seems like a logical place for the, the domain owners to be mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. they're creating their spreadsheets. And so, you know, I think that if we empower the domain owners and give them a way to build context on their own, mm -hmm. you know, maybe side by side with the likes of ontologists, for example, mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. because you want that quality, yeah. then maybe we could um, build up this, this data quality capability so that there's yeah. a knowledge component to it. And I, I've that, seen that, and that trend. Way it's scalable. Yeah, no, I, I have seen that trend. Like the Honest Review series is um, interesting because it always shows up, you know, who who's showing up on that are the folks that are the new things that are popping up and a lot of people are talking about. And I start to see some of the trends because of that as well. And one of the big ones is making it as easy as possible for the, the business owners, the people that are not ontologists to build out that context in a way that the ontology and the graph can then pick up and, and just use. And I think that that's where, you know, on that publishing side that we were talking about, or just, you know, content domain owner kind of sides, there's obviously a lot of sensitive things that we need to make sure does not ever get into, you know, a shareable space. Like I think that a lot of guardrails exist, but I think that information literacy has to be there and uh, to understand what can be shared um, and when you're doing something, if you're actually sharing. I think that's the other thing. A lot of people don't realize they're sharing some of this data um, where they shouldn't be. So a lot more guardrails need to be in place. Um, but that's where the quality is already happening, right? Like when you are the owner of data and you then are responsible for that data and the repercussions of that data being wrong or inaccurate, you do take effort to do something about that. Now, does that mean that internal publisher content D kind of data is the most accurate? No. And can I say that to everyone here? No. I've heard so many people recently say, oh, well, we license all of our data, so it's all accurate. We don't need to do any fact checking or quality checking. And I'm like, no. As someone been, who has been in the, the product space of content for a very long time, that does not mean that. Does it mean it's a higher quality? Yes. But I think getting to, it's funny, like Alan goes way up here and I'm like, here. like I go from the 30,000 <laughs> to the, the 30 foot level. Being able to fact check and quality check your own data, even with all the things that you said, Alan, I think are important because, you know, if, if a, a lay person is going in and saying, well, I think that you know, height is defined this way because my data set is all about people. And then you have another part of your organization that's talking about the height of, you know, every every building that they have in their suite of brick and mortars. Height means a different thing. And so if you have a person that ends up being 17 feet tall because it got mixed up with like that, no bueno again, right? Yeah. So I think all of that is going to show up a lot more in 2024 as a like, <gasps> Oh, but I thought I had good data. I mean, I made my data. I checked my data, but now someone else is using my data and it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a couple aspects there. One, you know, we've talked before about the importance of things like uh, dimensional analysis, you know, which is, which is precisely what you're talking about here in, in terms of, of saying, you know, we need to be able to make sure that the information is consistent in terms of units, in terms of how you're describing monetary yeah. concepts, you know, stuff like that. And that's, you know, that's that's one of the big power powerpoints that you can get out of a knowledge graph is is that consistency, that ability to say, you know, when mm -hmm. we're talking about height, this is what we mean. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know that gets back into into the whole concept of what is an annotation. Uh, because that that metadata is very important if you're if you're talking about you know any kind of cross domain 
sharing of information, you need to be able to make sure that your understanding of concepts is basically consonant to, not necessarily the same, but mm. at least close enough to be able to say, okay, we understand that there has to be a conversion, a relationship of some sort here to be able to make this happen. Um, you know, you can do that with an LLM, but it's an expensive proposition. It's yeah. a very expensive proposition. Yeah. Um, you know, I will use LLM sometimes in my work. You know, I'm, I'm increasingly describing myself as an ontological engineer. You know, I specialize in transformations and moving information from one format to another and being able to say, you know, from one ontology to another. Um, and I think that, that that concept is important because if you recognize the fact that we do have different ways of describing information that mm -hmm. that that from a perspective of data, um, you know, you have to basically have at least some understanding of the differences in terms of how you and I represent things that make it very difficult to do when you're talking at a purely conceptual level. Because, you know, the, the, the problem that you see with LLMs is that you can't point to a concept and get a consistent answer back mm -hmm. because there is no there is no grid there is no URI that is somehow associated with height mm -hmm. um, that exists that is referenceable and that's one of those areas that because you don't have that absoluteness that ability to be able to say, this is how I define X, and this is how, if you want to communicate with, with me, that we need as a point of resolution in our contracts, which is what a transformation mm. is, then realistically speaking, we have to have something that promotes that consistency. It's consistency um, and traceability, right? And traceability, explainability. You know, traceability, yep. the explainability, the um, the um, the provenance. Um, you know, all of those pieces of information are not things that are well tracked in a system, which is only, yeah. you know, which is largely going to be cerebral. I mean, there's some really interesting things, and and I I work with LLMs all the time to be able to simplify how I'm building these transformations because it can at least give me the patterns that mm. I can be able to say, you know, when I've got these two maps, I can basically look at this, do something to say, okay, get me 80% of the way there. Now let's go in and deal with the hard spots. Let's go in and deal with the contentious areas. Let's go in yeah. and make sure that we've got those. So there is a place for it, but it's a specialist place for that. Yeah, and, and I think I, I think we need to get out of this idea of well, you know, it's it's a good general piece. We're not there yet. I don't think we're, no. we're even remotely close to there. Yet. Well, and and you know, really jumping even more into what Alan was mentioning about you know the, the quality and getting more of that you know feedback annotation piece a little bit that what you're talking about, Kurt, is also do we need to care about it all, right? So a lot of the LLMs right now are focused on general knowledge. And it's not even there yet on a lot of that. And you actually see in a lot of the comparisons between the different LLMs that are out there, that the models that are being trained on smaller data sets that are maybe more curated or, or um, more specialized are actually doing better. And that's because if you're trying to train something on everything, I remember, and I won't mention the name, um, there is a company that was sort of a startup. They were trying to make a graph of everything. And they approached me um, to, to, to work with them. This was a number of years ago. And so when I was asking them, what was the purpose of what they were trying to build this for? And they said, we just want to make a graph of everything because somebody's going to want that. And I was like, mm, pass, pass. I'm not getting involved in that. Um, and you know what? They're still a company. They, I, they're, I, they're still a startup, I think, but they still have a business model. Um, but that is essentially what they're all trying to do right now. They're trying to gobble up as much information as possible. We've already touched on the fact that, you know, there's garbage in and garbage out. 
Um, they're running out of data, which is where I, the, uh, back to that publishing piece, like, well, there's a whole lot of data behind paywalls and firewalls, to, you know, that, that are out there um, that could be utilized, you know, appropriately. And that's why, you know, I do believe in open science, especially, um, but we got to do it responsibly. And we have to make sure that the folks that are putting the effort in are getting accommodated for their efforts, right? And all that good stuff that we need to account for. Um, but do we need all of it? Like, do you really need Joe Schmo's blog about how rats are taking over the world? Like, do you really need all the conspiracy <laughs> theory blogs? Do you all, do you need, you know, the blogs from the grandmas of, you know, 30 years ago talking about like their, their kiddos, their grandkids. I mean, maybe, you know, there's, there's maybe, you know, use cases for, for that, but you know, I. Niche I, use it, cases, niche, niche use cases. Yeah, but those I, are, can, can I just introduce yeah, a metaphor yeah, yeah. here? Cause I think it's direct, uh, directly relates to what you're talking about, yeah. Ashley. I do some woodworking and I can't claim to be a woodworker, but, but um, we moved into this old house here in San Jose and um, it was wonderful because it was built in the thirties and it, it really hadn't been touched a lot. So we're just restoring it. And we're, we're, we've been many years in this project. And so I've been doing whatever woodworking I can. Um, and, and doesn't mean we don't hire other people to do more mm -hmm. specialized things, but what you learn as a woodworker is, you're not going to let go of your hand tools mm. because there are always opportunities to use hand tools mm -hmm. and you're, you're learning how to, to use new tools when they become available. Years ago, there was the, the fine multi-tool, which was this mm -hmm. vibrating tool that you could use for, for specialized cuts and things. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, uh, you, you, you learn how to use the tools where they're appropriate mm -hmm. and, and you have a lot of tools available to you. And you see these people on YouTube who are expert woodworkers, which I am not. And you see how efficient they are mm -hmm. at what they're doing. And it's just a wonderful experience to watch them. And if you think about a business and how it should operate, it ought to be like those expert woodworkers they mm -hmm. ought to be as efficient as they can be and there's so many things that they're using to help them become more efficient and it's all part of this ecosystem mm -hmm. um so you know it just seems like we're far from the expert woodworking stage yeah. in llms yeah yeah I, and and i think that there's a few things not just the content side but i think <clears throat> what i'm i've finally started calling boutique uh, data sets is going to be a big thing in, in 2024 where, you know, maybe it's coming from publishers, maybe it's coming from uh, entrepreneurial minded folks that, you know, you can sit down and make a data set, right? Like you don't have to be a data person to make a data set. It's a, you can make a spreadsheet. It's a CSV and it's got lots of good data on this thing that you're passionate about. I, I, I don't think that's going to be a 2024 thing, but I feel like we're going to start to see the rumblings of that where, you know, you, maybe you are not an ontologist, but you know that every time you go to the LLM, it gives you the wrong information or it gives you like garbled information on something. And so more of these boutique data sets, I think, are, are going to start to, to show up. And I also feel like boutique annotators, meaning people that go in and tell you, like, as the expert in gardening of orchids, I am like the expert on this topic. And I can tell you this is wrong, this is right, and this is this, and this is that. Um, and, you know, I think that the provenance is going to be even more important with that, because if you, if you're using an LLM, can get a verified or a, this thing has been, I hate verified because there's a whole problem with that with the x slash twitter yeah. stuff that i don't want to touch but you know like this thing has been reviewed by someone who is an expert in whatever you know or here are the sources that this actually came from and they're not made up and there's, you know like there's there's some of the um you know when you're looking at uh citation indexes right um, again there's some problems with that space as well but you can tell how and this, this ties into the Times thing, by the way, right? That they were getting weighted higher because they are a more trustworthy source. 
Everybody does that in machine learning. Everybody it, with your own content. This is more trustworthy because it comes from this department and we know they do good data and they do this and they do that and blah, blah, blah. That's what everybody does with machine learning, whether it's an LLM or not, right? And so it's fascinating to see that that was one of the main things that they were like pointing to in, in their legal case. Um, but I do think that these boutique is, is it, you know, super trustworthy? Um, what's the lineage on it? Like that, does it come with a paper of authenticity kind of thing is going to become even more of not just a trend, but a cottage industry, honestly, in 2024 and beyond, because, um, you know, you're, there's going to be somebody that's the expert and all the celebrity parents or something like I'm telling you, it's going to get crazy out there before it gets sane. <laughs> Yeah. On that front, and I, I think this is there. There's one really big, dangerous factor I see right now with the LLM space, and that is that it it devalues experts, mm. um, and that can be very, very dangerous because it basically says says we are moving, we're we're making the expert into GPT. Mm. Um, and you're losing the provenance, you're losing the origin of a lot of this information. Mm -hmm. And as you do that, it also means that those experts, who for the most part are depending upon their expertise to be able to continue doing what they do, um, are now facing more and more challenges as this information basically devalues what they're doing. I think it's a perception um, of devalue, though. I don't think they're think, actually I, less value. I think there's more value to them. It's just that perception. But, but the perception, the perception is there. I mean, it's it. The you know, I you see in the industry right now that there is a very downward trend on very downward pressure on wages in the IT space, for example, or for that matter, in the kind of adjacent SME space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people organizations basically come to the belief that, well, you know, we can get all this information from these big sources and, you know, we can offload a lot of our need for expertise to something like this, which is basically hand expertise in a box. Um, you know, despite the fact that that expertise is is something that is living and growing and breathing and and does change over time, which means that that can mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. reflect you know that intelligence. Yeah. Um. But you know that's the perception that I think is pushing this, and I also think it's backfiring <laughs> because I've I've noticed after a significant dip in 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 wages, you're beginning to see that creeping back up. As people are beginning to realize, no, you can't rely upon this. No, you don't have the the ability to be able to say, I can replace all my programmers with. Uh, it goes back to the uh, cost thing. Oh, I can replace all my taxonomies with LLM. No, I'm not can't. even saying not... you can do that. But like, shh, do you want to pay that cost, or do you want to pay the the lonely taxonomist that you probably have on your staff, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, and, and I, I see that with with uh, the data science folks. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's again, you know, a, a data scientist brings a wealth of information, but all too often, in organizations that tend to look at it only in terms of of you know the immediate cost of things, without looking at the longer term cost, you know, involved. Yeah. Um, you know that you know those people that you're dealing with are. Um, you know, they, they're the reason that this web exists, that the reason that, that, you know, open, a, open AI yeah. can basically put up something like this. Well, and someone has to mind the store, right? Yeah. Like this has been the biggest fallacy. One of the biggest fallacies in machine learning before LLMs even existed is great. I can train a machine to do this. I can fire all those people and I can save money and it's going to be even better. Except well, who? Who's going to look at that model and that output and make sure it's still makes sense for a human, still is accurate, you know, is keeping up with the trends and, and making sure that, you know, as us as humans become more evolved, we understand certain things 
are maybe not appropriate to discuss in that way anymore. Now we have to update those things. How do we pick up some of those nuances about eggplants that are out there, right? Like things like that, you still need the people to, you know, man or woman, the, the, the store, you need someone to watch the store. And I, I fear that um, the trend that I was seeing before LLMs hit, which was get rid of many and keep few to, to then mine the store, those folks are now being hugely overworked and they're dropping like flies. Like I, I see so many people dropping out because they are just burned out. They cannot keep up because again, this whole fallacy that you can just get rid of a bunch of people because now the LLM can do it. And I, get, I go back to my analogy of machine learning is like a really smart computer, right? It's a bunch of ones and zeros. It's really, really good. It's a really great tool. And I think we've we've said this over a few times in, in, in this video here. It, it still needs that human interaction. I, I am still a firm believer in human in the loop. And, you know, that doesn't mean that you continue to staff your 100 you know, headcount team of of people that are doing one thing, um, it's probably making their jobs more efficient, right? And maybe you can do more, right? Like that's the other thing that I look back on is like I get like everybody has to cut back on costs right now and all of that that stuff. But there is all and, and that's why they hire you you two folks, right? That are uh you know consulting on on stuff. They don't have enough people with expertise to do certain things because they have more work than people or more work than time to actually complete. That's not changing, right? And so instead of just laying off a bunch of people, pick up that other stuff that you were meaning to do for so long. And I think that's going back to an early point that, that you made, Alan, which is leadership. <laughs> leadership well, uh, needs help. <laughs> and it's like we have so many way, more ways to fail as, as, yeah. as a company. Yeah. Um, and, and it goes back to this, you know, 90-10 scenario, or maybe it's an 80-20 scenario where, where you know, the 20% are, are going to make out very well and, and do extremely well. And the other 80% might get left behind mm. because of this. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's just a matter of, who's succeeding and who's not. And, and we're looking at these failures and we're, we're alarmed by them, but there's going to be successes. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I just wish we could highlight the, uh, the leadership faculties of the ones that are succeeding yeah. and how they're succeeding and, and, um, and sort of step back from the technology worship and, yeah. and, and look at, the humanistic element of it. We've got, um, I had this little discussion group that I, that I helped moderate for a couple of years uh, on personal knowledge graphs. And mm -hmm. it's, it's morphed into more of a think tank. Um, mm -hmm. Recently, it's called the Data Worthy Collective. And it, it really, it's, it's humanistic mm -hmm. in, in the intelligence. And I think the humans need more <laughs> intelligence than they have in a lot of cases. Yeah. And that's why we're running into more and more problems because it's just so easy to shoot yourself in the foot these days. Yeah. And I will say, um, and Kurt, I, I'm going to move on to a different topic. So Kurt, do you have final thoughts on this? No, I, I absolutely agree with, with Alan. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very definitely worried about what we're doing right now in terms of ceding too much authority to, to the tech gods without really Know, taking into account the fact that that's not necessarily a bright thing to do. Yeah, and don't get me so, wrong; like, there's some brilliant people out there that, um, you know, are, and maybe this isn't. I don't know if this is going to be a trend. I want it to be. Let's put it that way. It's a. It's. I hope it's a trend. And this is coming from someone that has multiple advanced degrees. Okay, that doesn't mean you're smart, and that doesn't mean you know any better than anyone else. And there is a reason that it doesn't say doctor in front of my name. I don't use it that way because I used it to educate myself and give myself that opportunity to learn and to grow and to be able to talk to experts in this field and, and spread my research wings, right? That's why I did what I did. What I have seen a lot of, and this is not new, is um, 
the 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 folks that are being turned to um and i'm not even discouraging from doing that they they are very smart very good people but that doesn't mean they know everything and that also doesn't mean that you know if you think differently or if you're like hmm, that smells funny that you're wrong um follow that lead um, and just because you don't have multiple PhDs and you don't work at like, you know, one of the the big fangs or something, um, you, that doesn't mean that you, you don't have something to say and you don't, you're not wrong, uh, or you're not right. I should say, um, they could be wrong. And in many cases they are. So, you know, maybe this is a little nebulous of a thing, but the, the dependency on, oh, this person has this many citations, they have this many PhDs. Or, or advanced degrees or certificates or whatever it is. And we're going to bring them in because I've seen this a lot. If you look at the job postings and people moving around, the experts in academia um, or who used to be in academia, the folks that with those very, very high credentials are getting scooped up left and right by big companies to help them figure this stuff out. And again, doesn't mean that they're not wonderful, great people. They're going to move you very far. But um, there's, there's a lot of things that you need to consider with that. And that doesn't mean they're always right. Let's, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> just very opinionated. Yes. Yeah, well, know, and there, it's, it's interestingly enough, I have been very, very, um, lucky to have worked with folks, you know, in multiple companies in multiple ways that I'm just associated with that are those high caliber people. Um, and they are, some of them, the ones that I know, at least, um, are some of the most humble. And I know that's not normal, <laughs> right? Such nice people. And they will, they'll, they'll be the quiet ones in the room and be like, well, have you considered? And they'll say something like that. And then it's like, boom. What I think we all as a collective need to do is help those folks be used appropriately because even they struggle. Um, they're not always doing it purposely. A lot of them do, but they're not even always doing it purposely. But they command so much weight with just the simple things that they say. Sometimes they um, distract, right? From like, this is the simple, <laughs> keep it simple, stupid, simple is sometimes the easiest way to go. Um, and, and just pushing that boundary constantly is not even a bad thing, but make sure that that person is not the be all end all is, is maybe the, the theme I want to see arising um, because I've been involved in, far too many projects where those folks meant well, their authority carried a little too much weight. And um, because someone could not cite something, which, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of the projects that we all work on, you cannot cite, you can't even talk about half of them, right? And so talking to folks that maybe have experience, even if it can't be citable, I think is important. Yeah, and just to add to that, Ashley, I think um, it reminds me of a previous uh, career I had uh, in government, and, and I have a, a, a degree in political science things, you know, international policy studies. And one of the things we, we one of the books we read was a book called Groupthink when I was in school oh, yeah. by Irving Janus, and, and it had a case study uh, from the Kennedy administration that talked about the um, Bay of Pigs debacle. Oh, yeah. And um, just this um, whole notion that that the uh, the people involved in getting us into this Bay of Pigs um, scenario, uh, it was just, uh, the group think was just dominant. So mm -hmm. uh, Kennedy, with the best of intentions, got to all these academics together Mm -hmm. to, to make these decisions. And it turned out to be exactly a formula for disaster. Yeah. And he turned it around quickly because with the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. um, they did the right things. But, you know, he also um, set up the, the situation for Vietnam. So you need this diverse intellectual yeah. cadre. You need a cadre, but mm -hmm. it needs to be all these diversely thinking people yeah, who yeah. don't necessarily agree with one another. And if you go back to the Lincoln administration, he intention Lincoln intentionally picked people for his cabinet who were going to be the thorns in the sides of everybody else. But 
that led to success. So, so you really need lots of different people in the mix here. And that's, yes, but that, also that's my interpretation of what you're saying. Yeah. And I, I would say yes, but it's also making sure that those other voices can be heard because I think yeah. oftentimes if you're in a room of people that have multiple PhDs and you're the lone person that doesn't, <laughs> Yeah. You maybe are second guessing your own thoughts on these things, right? So I think it's more of a, a you know, support structure, perhaps, including, you know, in addition to what you're saying, Alan, because, yeah. you know, if if you are, um, and again, like, I won't go into this too much, but I am a woman in tech, and sometimes it's not that easy to break into the shouting voices <laughs> in a room. So even though I am one of the people with a PhD, right? So I will say that, you know, it's it's not just making sure that you have a lot of different voices, but those voices can be heard. And also that if you as a leader or or someone in that that group that is trying to make decisions on things and strategize on things, if you start to see yourself or others start to gravitate and put too much weight on any given one person's authority or perception on something that you pull back and just say, hmm, I mean, doesn't even mean that's wrong, but just like take a moment and make sure that that is accurate because, um, yeah, I've seen that too often that people just kind of get sucked along and <laughs> just going along with that one person. I, I, I had made, made the comment earlier about the, um, the, the opinionated um, and, you know, I believe this is true. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm very much an introvert, you know, very, very, if you, if you, if you, if I take a test for introvertedness, I always end up on the extreme end of the scale. <laughs> you know, I, I don't like leaving my house. It's kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but those kind of people, you know, one, they do tend to be on average, they're going to be your authorities. They're going to be your subject matter experts. They're going to be the people that by and large have focused on one thing to a sufficient extent to be able to gain the expertise where I think you run into problems. Um, and exactly what you're alluding to is that, you know, that expertise also carries with it. You have basically got to the point where you have absorbed a certain degree of knowledge. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, um, you know, that what you know is correct. It only means that you have basically achieved um, enough of an expertise to be able to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, the content, but you will have opinions. You know, any intelligent mm -hmm. person does. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, you you. I, I can remember distinctly. Um, I was doing a project for uh, Harvard Business Review for their library, and I had in um, when I was working with them, there was this group of about uh, a dozen librarians, mostly female, um, all basically arguing about the nature of specific terms. Oh boy, I have been and in that I'll room many you, times. You, I'm sure you have. You know, we have. We, you know, as an ontologist, you're you're going to be in those situations where yeah. you have the screaming matches, oh, and, yeah. and you know, you you go in almost expecting that someone is going to eventually emerge, you know, bloodied <laughs> and battered, but they will have accomplished the task of saying, "I am right, damn it, I am right." <laughs> um, and you know that. That can be a, um, you know, that contention is important because you do need to have people that have expertise basically challenging one another about whether or not that expertise is pertinent to this domain mm -hmm. or this particular problem. Um, you know, it's it it's one of those things that, you know, yes, and you see this in academia all the time. You see it in you know, and I, I've seen it in astronomy and in places like that where, you know, very well established, this is almost orthodoxy, comes into challenge because some new kid says, well, wait, you know, what about this theory? Yeah. And no one immediately jumps on that theory. You know, that's mm -hmm. it's going to take a long time and a lot of effort. 
and sometimes they it you know it, you you have to wait for everyone to die out before the theory gets <laughs> gets in place. I, or, I take a like, look at. Oh, go ahead. I take a look at you know people like Lynn Margolis, um, who was you know a, a pioneer in the area of of bacteriology. And, uh, you know, she had a number of theories about the fact that, you know, that from her perspective, all of all of human existence basically came down to this this roving swarm of bacteria that happened to be in general proximity to one another. Um, a very powerful concept, not something that most people endorsed until much later after she died, mm-hmm. where people were saying, you know, she's right. Um, sorry, but, but yes, you know, I, I, you know, there, there's an interesting topic uh, that you see again, especially with the llamas on the AI side, talking about mixtures of experts Mm -hmm. where they're beginning to accommodate this, but to do that, you basically have to have dissent. You have to have differing viewpoints, and if your data set does not have that differing viewpoints, mm-hmm. then it's going to basically steer you in a direction that may be completely inappropriate because there isn't something to be able to say, wait, there is a counterfactual that you need to be thinking about. Yeah. Or maybe the real consensus lies somewhere between these points and not at this point in particular. Yeah. Uh, just simply yeah. because it has the most weight doesn't mean that it's necessarily mm-hmm. correct. Yeah, you know, there's, um, oh, it, so I did a video a while back. It was like a, a silly, fun video for uh, the Halloween time a few years ago. It did terribly. It has less than 100 views. It's like dead on, on arrival. Um, but I reference it here because it actually, if you did what I said in that video, is kind of a fun experiment that I've started to see others start to do, which is you want to figure out if the LLNs are taking your data and using it, and you want to find out how well um, it's it's fact-checking itself. And so I've actually seen people creating um, spoof data sets and just putting them out there and seeing like how, and, and they just query, you know, once in a while, the LLM of any given uh, open source one that they're they're working on and uh, just to see if they can pick up that data because they know it's it's a spoof, right? It's the only data out there that's going to say this thing. And they start to find it. They start to find it and then they start to see what the LM is doing with it and all the hallucinations that the, the LM puts around it. And I'm not actually encouraging anyone like mass to go out and do that because that would mess up a lot of things. But this gets into a different topic on on this, and that is social engineering stuff, right? Like where people have started to pick up on, well, if I do this, what's the LM going to do about it? And how can I use the LM to kind of help me figure out, you know, what any given person is is saying at any given point, you know, on socials? Um, even on on the other side of that coin, that's not maybe as scary from a content creator perspective, um, you know, contemplating, like I was thinking about this the other day, I'm not going to do this, putting it on record, I'm not going to do this because it's too scary to do. (laughs) But why couldn't I train, why couldn't I train an LLM on my own YouTube content? I have enough of it. Um, And Kurt, I saw your recent post on LinkedIn about how now you can get um, even with a, just one image to get um, voice and video going on on anything, just make videos off of my own old videos yeah. <laughs> moving forward. Again, I'm not going to do that, but like you could, right? And and there's nothing unethical about that from your own copyright perspective. Now, is it unethical for your audience? I actually think yes, right? Like I think you need to be upfront and honest about when you're using this stuff and what for. Um, but I think more of that stuff is is going to start showing up. And I some of it's good, some of it's bad. So I'm not going to be the doomsdayer here. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting to see what's but, but I, yeah, I think I, I I would just say the bigger point might be, you know, the the more power ends up in the hands of particular individuals. Um, the the more risk there becomes, mm. and yeah. and so, um, 
you, you have this scenario where where um, uh, information is power, and mm. it, more and more of that power is ending up in the hand of of individuals who who could choose to do something less than good with it. Yeah. Um, so that's always the gamble with anything open. And I do wonder, yeah. like, I know you said very early on and everyone's going to talk about, that's another trend of 2024 is the regulations and the laws and all those things. Like, I think, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting how that shapes up. I'm sorry, Ellen, I interrupted. Go ahead. No, no, no. But I, th I think I was pretty much finished with my point and, and, um, it's, you just see it in so many different places now. Yeah, and and I, I think the the whole uh, the the people who are looking at risk and and how to assess it are are really changing their models as a result. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and and those people are going to be more and more important in this in this whole scenario because yeah. you won't be able to do business in ways you have before because yeah. this power because of this power shift. Yeah, but let me let me add let me add a little bit to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's remember, and it's not something I think most people realize, but these large, you know, the GPTs and the and um, the uh, what's Google's now the, the latest that they released, not Genesis, Sub but something bar. like that. What? No. Oh, I, anyway. I can't. yeah, yeah. But they're social media. We we have to remember that they are social media. They are. They are media that basically large numbers of people interact with. They aren't yet, and I think this will change in this next year. They're not yet at a point where that social media is, is interactive or collaborative beyond, you know, human machine interaction. Mm -hmm. But that's coming. You know, I I honestly think that that you know the evolution of Chat GPT is is ultimately it's going to be Microsoft's next major social media platform, and it's yeah. already there to begin with. But the the whole issue that you run into with any social media is the fact that yes, it does have an incredible degree of potential in being and able to say what and addiction and addiction, and addiction yes. Um, but it has an incredible degree of, of potential to be used by bad actors mm -hmm. uh, in very subtle ways that I think are going to be increasingly dangerous to society um, and, you know, that are going to require a certain degree of intervention, not just from the company that hosts it, but from mm. the larger community, of, you know, organizations you know yeah. um uh you know any type of regulatory environment those are things you know they exist for a reason no one might yeah. like those regulations but they exist to make sure yeah that you're not putting a time bomb in the hands of people that are basically unscrupulous and i think the other part of it is there is a line right that a lot of people probably would agree on between bad actors unscrupulous and the other side. But I think the line itself is getting gray and wider. And so as an example, there are now uh, a lot of chat bots that are being used, generative AI to be used for dating apps, which you might think, okay, consenting adults do whatever, blah, 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 except there's not a whole lot of age restrictions on these things. And so, you know, there's one and it was um, by, oh, what's his name? Bernard Marr, I think his name is, um, on LinkedIn. He posted this a while back. He had a great interview. And if I can find it, I'll, I'll link it down below. It was a very interesting but scary article. Again, I'm not going to be the doomsdayer. But um, I think the coupling of social media, which is highly addictive, I do think in 2024, we're going to see the rise of the 15 second or less feed. Like TikTok is already short, but they're going more like long form. And then YouTube, of course, was already long form. And they're going short form. I think the attention span and the adrenaline rush is going to be so much faster. It's going to be like half 
half the size of your typical commercial is what we're going to start to see. Um, but I think that's also going to have the rise of the in demand and maybe regulatory um, demand for attribution, right? Where did this come from? What model was used? Does this have product placement? Is this age appropriate? And um, having more regulations around that. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of the apps that exist are not really under certain laws um, to follow some of these things. Um, but I, I think that that's the part that is, is going to make this whole thing a lot more complicated is, you know, if you can see someone doing something, for instance, unscrupulous with children, you're going to say, yep, bad, right? Like, I think most people on the earth will agree with that. Um, but then what if you have a legitimate business that is, you can craft your own girlfriend, it exists already. You can craft your own girlfriend and you can actually train her on what she can and cannot say to you. Yeah. Okay. And Let's get into how, not here, but I'm saying like in 2024 <laughs> and beyond, the, as society, right? This is going to start to show up more and more. And it's unfortunately going to show up with our children because again, information literacy, I am now a parent of a teenager and I will tell you, I am educating my kid but I will tell you, none of the other parents are doing that. And they themselves have no idea. And it is frightening to see what is like going out even today. And I can only see it getting worse and worse. And so, you know, again, not being the doomsdayer, because there's a lot of good that can come out of these things as well. Like a lot of good has come from the Internet. Not so good things come from the Internet, too. Um, I think this is one of them. Right. Like, I think that um, being able to understand the ethical pieces to it and the age appropriateness and just, you know, helping people be better educated on these things. It's got to happen. And I think it's going to happen because some, some not so nice things will happen first, unfortunately. Right. I, I, I know we, we probably need to wrap things up, so I don't want to drag this out too much further. Yeah. Um, but I work a lot with diffusion technology and videos and I record a mm -hmm. lot of, on those because I think, you know, in many respects, I think, you know, we get into discussion about chat GPT and the text stuff and the coding, and that's, you know, that's important. But realistically, you know, we're at a stage right now where avatars are, are you know, they will be the big topic of 2024. Yeah. Um, you know, I have no question about that. I'm watching the technology evolve. We have all the pieces in place. We have, you know, we're, we're getting to the point where we can synthesize damn near anything that we want in terms Avatars of the Avatars and the robots to go with them, because I think it can and be the, physical. Yeah, I, I think I think the physical will come, but I don't think yeah. that that's necessarily going to be the immediate. You know, avatars are, are immediate. They, yeah. they, they are definitely right yeah. now, right here. Um, and, you know, I work very heavily with this kind of generated content. And I'll tell you, I'm I'm reaching a point where someone who basically is is you know heavily involved in working with this can't tell whether or not that I'm dealing with a synthetic or a real person. Yeah. And if I can't tell, you know, someone who's been basically watching this for very subtle clues, it means it's getting to the point where the average person has no idea, has no clue about what's happening. I mean, happening. we're already there. I mean, even not even talking AI, like I talk to older folks in my family and they're watching things in the news and through TikTok or, or you know, whatever. And they're like, this is real, this hack. Look at this new hack I found. And it's so raw. It's 100% fake. They can't tell. Like then, that's real life. <laughs> and and you know, I think I think that's that cuts back to the attribution issue. You know, yes. we we get to the point where we as ontologists, as as you know, as as people who basically are very very concerned about the nature of language and the nature of you know visual language that we're dealing with as well, we need to start speaking up. Yeah, we need to start basically making it, you know, making it more obvious when we're talking about this, that look, you know, it is not healthy in a society where you have no trust about what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very dangerous place to mm -hmm. be. Um, and it's, you know, I think that that is going to be 
one of the big contentious issues this year as all of this AI, as all of the these you know, generated avatars and and similar pieces come out in real time, you know, essentially in being able to say, I can sit there and use another, uh, use a synthesized voice with a synthesized face and synthesized background to be able to say and do things that are, you know, they're, they're the ultimate area of anonymity. And well, because, you know, and, and anonymity, there's some benefits to have with anonymity, but there's also some very real dangers. And a big part of that is that you have no accountability. Yeah. You have yeah. no way of being able to say, okay, you know, this is not real. Um, well, and, and on the other side know, of it, if you're the one being anonymized, you feel, and this, the, you see this all the time, again, with, you know, people online just bashing each other on certain things because they're behind you know, their, their avatar name, like that you don't know who they really are. Yeah. Right. So you can't go after them. And, and because of that, to your point, Kurt, I think the other side of it is the person that knows they don't have accountability can just say and do whatever they want and, and feel like, you know, it's dehumanizing in a way. There, there's one other thing I just want to point out on this topic, Kurt, too, before you go on that that's kind of been, you know, in the back of my mind recently, as of today, if you see anything that looks like Mickey Mouse, that thing, that thing, Mickey Mouse, that face, right? Anybody that's not paying attention would think, oh, this is endorsed or attributed to Disney. As of 2024, stroke of midnight, Mickey Mouse is no longer under copyright, at least the early Mickey Mouse. I think the modern Mickey Mouse still is. But things like Winnie the Pooh, is another one that that is now in the public domain. So this whole copyright, what does copyright really mean? And attribution, I think those are going together because there's so much brand recognition. Like if you saw someone and you know Disney is really strict on who's allowed to use their properties and you see something you know, show up and it's got Disney stuff all over it, you would be like, oh, I brand recognize this. It's not real attribution. And that's what people are banking on. But- Anybody can use Winnie the Pooh. That's why um, there was a horror movie that came out about Winnie the Pooh recently because he's public domain. Anyone can use him. Same with, I think, uh, who else? Um, Sherlock Holmes is public domain. And this year it was Mickey Mouse. In a few years, it's going to be Donald Duck. It's like all of these things that the average person has no idea, but they have that trust factor because of the copyrights. But copyrights run out. And then they go into public domain if nothing is done. And more and more of that has been happening over the last few years. And it's only going to keep increasing. And I think that coupled with all the stuff you just said, Kurt, is a recipe for some craziness going on. Yeah, I I, it, I, I have a feeling that there are many, many, many lawyers at, at, at the <laughs> Disney Company that you know spend a great deal of time at night going, what do we do about this? I know. Well, they did get an um, extension, I think, on something on the copyright, but it it ran out. Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's there, there's a reason copyrights run out, and I'm I'm not I'm not disagreeing that they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there there comes a point where yes, you know, the the existence of of Sherlock Holmes as an example has become so ingrained into our culture yeah. that it's no really no longer really of benefit to be able to protect. I mean, it's, it's yeah. the same thing with patents. Yeah. But it's also, uh, it also basically, you know, all of this is now becoming priority simply because the, so much of so many of these companies really are built upon these characters and, yep. and, and the know, trust this is a relatively it. recently phenomenon. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and that in and of itself is also going to be, um, yeah. I, I think in many ways that the one benefit I can see about it is that I think collectively, a lot of corporations are going to start taking copyright much more seriously than they oh, do now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the, I, I, I can't see them not. And if that's the case, then it will end up showing up in legislation at some point where, where you say, okay, 
you know, how do you protect things when they're no longer within your domain to protect? Yeah. Or is that in fact, you know, fair use? Or can you um, make sure that the public at least understands that this is not, you're not Disney does not own this anymore. Yeah. It's a, anybody can do this and just making sure they yeah. are understanding and well aware. Yeah, which which is going to be harder the more and more these things these yeah. things slip out of copyright. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I know we have been going for quite some time, but I am not surprised. We we typically do. And um, as I suspected, the the LLM thing just kind of peppered its way through everything anyways. Um, but in in final final remarks, um, I'll start with you, Alan, because I know you're always too polite to break into to me and Kurt. So, Alan, final thoughts on what's going on in 2024? What do you hope for 2024? Well, I, I, I hope for um, boldness in, in, in ways we might not have had it in 2023. And, and we were just discussing the copyright issue. And there's this, this um, person in the bubble issue that, mm -hmm. that keeps reemerging where um, uh, I, I'm frustrated with, with the news media and the social mm -hmm. media because I'm, I keep getting served up things that I know I'm interested in, but I, I'm not interested in them at a particular moment in time or yes. my, my interest has waned. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, I used to be a big Quora contributor mm -hmm. um, because I love the question and answer format. Mm -hmm. And and I can't get out of the Quora bubble. I mean, it, it's like I've tried to, to figure out ways to just be a plain vanilla user on Quora. Yeah. But, you know, without using my somebody else's identity, and it's not possible. Yeah. And so... Um, I just think there's going to be um, more rogue media out there that could mm. be beneficial mm -hmm. in some ways. I, the, the, um, the, the standard personalization techniques just have, have not been ultimately useful in bigger ways and they mm -hmm. need to be useful in bigger ways. So um, I, I'm, I'm looking more toward the independence. Mm -hmm to make a big splash in 2024. Mm. So fingers crossed that that happens. And, and um, I keep watching decentralization. It's a lot less mature than it needs to be, mm. but there are pieces of decentralization that, that are starting to be extremely powerful. And I can't articulate how that's going to be, but, but um, you know, look for something beyond the standard blockchain stuff and the mm. standard interplanetary file system stuff mm -hmm. emerging. That's mm -hmm. going to be useful to us. Yeah. So for what it's worth, that's, that's my thinking for um, signing off here. <laughs> Kurt, ha how about you? What, what are your, your la last quick takes and what are your, you know, hopes and dreams for 2024? Um, a, a few critical ones. Um, I, I can you know I I see the rise of what I call lambda graphs, mm. um, you know which are to to Alan's point you know we're getting to the point where um, you're going to see these hybrid structures appear at all levels you know from mm. the very big ones the GPT literally down to you know here's a watch or here's a car or something like that that has its own internal um, system for being able to query an interface. And I think this is one of the positive things that I see out of the, the LLM side mm -hmm. is that it, it does mean that I, as a person, can query into the data to be able to ask it without being a specialist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a yeah. powerful, powerful tool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that as we... You know, I think that that we in the in the the graph space need to recognize that in order for us to continue to be relevant and to become more relevant to the overall conversation, we need to first of all recognize that that's the the expected way of interaction that has now been trained into us in the last year, mm -hmm. and will become more so in the future. 
yes, you know, you still need to understand what you're doing to get really meaningful content, but I want to be able to talk to my car. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to ask my car what's wrong with it and not have it to have just a damn uh, <laughs> engine light, you know, popping on telling me, okay, there's something wrong with your car. It may be something as simple as you need to change your oil, or it may be, well, you've just blown a gasket. I don't know mm -hmm. because all I have is that one bit of information. Yeah. And I want to be able to talk to my car. I want to be able to talk to my, uh, you know, my, my watches and my, my other interfaces to an extent that I can at least get their state. And mm -hmm. I think that concept is something that is, is moving into all levels of society. It means that what's going to emerge is not going to be what existed before. Mm -hmm. It means that, you know, for a lot of vendors in the space, they're going to have to adapt accordingly. Um, but I think, you know, the ones that have recognized that are already making that step to be able to move it. Broader term, we're in a whole new era. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a profound, there's so many issues where computing is now impacting society. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've not really, we've been inching towards that, but it's increasingly getting to a point where it's, we're going to see a lot of disintegration in our society. And that doesn't mean it's just going to all fall apart you know, spontaneously. It just means <laughs> that, that as a society, we're now adapting to these changes of moving increasingly into the noosphere, into the knowledge sphere. Mm. Um, and that carries with it some very broad societal implications that we're just now really beginning to have to answer. Yes. And it's going to be a very exciting decade because of it, not just this year, but you know, for the next yeah. 10 to 20 years, it's going to have just powerful repercussions. Yeah. I I would that's, I would that's it for me. I, I would second a lot of what you both have said. Um, I think that there's, it's, it, it's, I've said it a few times in this video is the information literacy. I think that that's so critical in everything. You don't know what you don't know, right? And, and educating yourself on what is this thing? How do I use it? What should I be cautious of? is a part of everything that, that we sh do and it should be part of, you know, part of our DNA. Unfortunately, it's not. People pick things up and they just start using it. And, you know, lots of apps and devices and other things make it easy. You just pick it up and start using it because maybe they don't want you to really look into what they're doing with your data and who actually has access to it. And what is it actually looking at when you're just carrying this thing around with you? The average adult at least three years ago was picking up their phone every day at least 2,000 times and it's only increased and if you talk to talk about teenagers it's it's double that um and so you're constantly interacting with with things and you know making them smarter is good but also with the understanding of what it actually does right I think so many people just take it for granted that yeah it works fine I trust this thing called Facebook. And then, you know, they find out it's doing some crazy things on the other side. Um, but, you know, that that piece is a part that I want to see in 2024 is just more awareness and more voices coming out and breaking down the ivory towers so that, you know, you can talk about this to your grandmother or your your five-year-old niece is always my, my, you know, spectrum is I want to be able to talk to people about this in a simple way that they understand and they can just go in eyes wide open as much as possible because you can regulate stuff as much as you want, but people find ways around it. People go offshore, <laughs> people do all things to get around those things. Um, and so that's why, you know, that information literacy piece is, is so important. But I also, I want to see it used in um, high applicability, right? So LLMs and other things that we've talked about with the data being, you know, better, being able to do more with your data, um, having more voices, you know, involved in, you know, construction of all these different things, um, the specialities, all of that is, is well and good. But 
I so often see LLM still being thrown into the realm of, you know, sci-fi. And because they kind of are from the realm of sci-fi and they're just reality now. But I want to see it being used in things that it's really, really good at on an everyday basis, right? Because that's what it's going to be good for. And the things that are more specialized, maybe there's another LLM specialty piece that comes out of something like that. But to Kurt's point, like, I want to figure out what's wrong with my car. Yes. And this is a plug for another video coming up um, with Margaret, who is going to be talking to me about how identifying um, hard to label images um, is actually causing a lot of problems with LLMs. Causes a lot of problems with humans. If you took a picture of any given piece of my engine and it was close up, I actually know a decent amount about my engine. Um, I used to work in auto manufacturing, I better. Um, but if it's like close up enough, I don't know what it is. It could be a part of my of of my washer downstairs or my car. I don't know. You know, like being able to make it even more useful for the everyday. I think is 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 my wish for 2024. And, you know, yeah, there's some cool futuristic things that we can do with it. And we should never stop trying to push the boundaries. But, you know, I want to see more concentrated applications that are going to be real world, very useful, get it out to people. And I also hope and w wish, and I also predict that more normal folks getting engaged with that contextualization just because of necessity, you know, like we need better data, we need more voices, we need to have an easier way for people to interact with data and to do things with it. And I think that not only some of the things that you've all mentioned as far as like a person at an organization being able to get into maybe their knowledge graph without knowing Sparkle or something like that, but just like, again, my grandma being able to like, figure out where all of her passwords are <laughs> and being able to like, you know, put a, a reminder for herself to, uh, you know, change her password uh, every three months or whatever the, the guidance is like something super simple like that. And then just having a, a, an intelligent agent to, to help her with all of those things like that. It's so simple and it's so low hanging fruit. And it's there, kind of, but it's not really like, you know, maybe it's a, a production, a, a productization of it. Um, not even saying like you sell it as a product, but something that's like packaged and it can be, you know, sent to someone to, to do some of these activities, I think would be amazing. So that is 2024, guys. And we'll see. I always wonder sometimes like if we, if I should use these videos and do a look back to see like how good we were with our predictions. <laughs>